because not a lot of people know this, but I have been speaking a little bit about the fact that I am myself an experiencer. And for a long time, I didn't talk about it at all because I just couldn't. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I couldn't process it yet. And it takes some time to get to where you feel like you can speak publicly. And a lot of people find when they first start talking that even the people very near and dear to them can't process it either. It's a difficult thing to come to terms with, and you try to find help, and most people around you don't know how to come to terms with it, and so they can't help you. And I've seen um, some very difficult things that other people have gone through. I've been very, very lucky because I was linked into a really good support system right from the beginning. Um, but I did find that I didn't want to talk about it at first, as I said, because it was hard for me to process. And then I was afraid that people would think I was making things up to legitimize my place in this field. And, you know, and I think probably there are a few people who thought that. When you're looking into the field of UFO research, ufology, it's generally the first big question when someone is brand new to it. They've never thought about UFOs at all in their life. The first thing they're going to think of is, oh, are they even real? And most people will say, oh, you believe in those? I mean, we all know lots of people, family, friends, people who didn't come with us, who think we're a little bit nuts because we believe in UFOs. So that's like the first question that people come to. Once you accept that there are lights in the sky and they are moving around under some sort of control, then you realize somebody's flying these things. Who's controlling them? So then you, you have to wrap your mind around the fact that, oh my gosh, aliens are real. Okay, if aliens are real and they're coming here in these craft and they're flying them around, why would they come all this way? Are they interacting with people? Are they interacting in ways that are maybe not very nice? All those people who have been talked, talking about being abducted by aliens we see on TV and it's always reported that little chuckle, you know, and always the mention of the little green men. Gosh, maybe some of them are telling the truth. Yeah, we are. We have this thought that we are the center of the universe. You know, we used to think that the sun revolved around the earth. Okay, we got past that. But we still have this idea that we, human beings, are somehow the center of everything. And it's upsetting to some people to think there's somebody else out there. And by definition, if they figured out how to come here and we don't know how to go where they are, they must be smarter than we are. That's very threatening to some people. We have a lot to learn from this experience. And in, you know, when you start really thinking about it, there's a great deal that you can learn. We can actually evolve as a result of these contact experiences. But the whole problem is we don't understand so much of what's happening. And our brains are wired so that when we don't understand something, we automatically fear it. And this is a reasonable response because we have to evaluate in order to make sure this thing is not a threat. So when you think back to early stages of human evolution, when we're cavemen, if something happens that you don't understand, you have to think, is that going to kill me, or should I kill it first, or is it OK? And you have to respond first as if it's a threat to make sure you're safe. So that's fine. This is not an unreasonable response. OK, this is totally normal. But we need to get past it. Quite a few people this weekend have talked about their own experiences with abductions. There are a few common stereotypical elements that occur in most abductions, not in all of them. Everybody has unique experiences, but there are some threads that tend to recur. One is that an individual is taken either out of their bed while they're sleeping or from a car while they're driving. I found that interesting because I was wondering whether it has something to do with the state of your mind. You know, anybody who's driven long distances, and I do a lot, knows that you get in sort of a hypnotic state when you've been driving for a long time. And I'm curious to know whether these things happen when your brain waves reach a certain level that's different from normal waking consciousness. Um, the cases that I've heard that people have talked to me about personally that have happened while they're driving usually are late at night. 
And I know you, know you get kind of half asleep and drowsy while you're driving and you're looking at the road after mile after mile after mile. And I have to think if someone were to measure brain waves, it might be similar to when you're in your bed sleeping. But I didn't remember anything happening. I just remembered seeing figures in the room. And then I got back to sleep and thought, okay, that was it. That was over. What a weird dream that was. And this was when I was like 11 years old, so I didn't know anything about UFOs until I was about 30. So I didn't even get into this field, had no interest at all in it. I knew something odd had happened, but I didn't know what that was. I thought it was somehow related to ghosts, because I read ghost stories all the time when I was a kid, but I couldn't see how, it, it didn't seem like a standard ghost story either. I didn't like see a white floating figure. I saw dark figures standing in my room. And I closed my eyes and said, okay, I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. When I wake up, when I open my eyes, they'll be gone because I'll be awake. And I had to do it six or seven times. But then finally, yes, I did open my eyes and they weren't there. And I said, okay, good. I woke myself up. And everything was fine until morning when I stood up out of bed and looked at my arm and there's that triangle. I would say a good 85 to 90% of the people who come to me at conferences and want to tell me their story are begging me to tell them that it's not an alien abduction. I've had people say to me, please tell me I'm crazy. Convince me I'm nuts so I can go to a doctor. I would so much rather think I'm crazy than that the whole world is not what I thought it was. And that people are coming into my house at night and taking me out and I don't know what they're doing and I don't know why and I can't stop them. And then when they find out that it, goes, it follows generations and they think, and this is gonna happen to my kids and I can't do anything about that either, I mean, this is serious stress, and a lot of people in this room already know this. We are not as small and weak as we believe we are. There are some pretty amazing things that the human mind is able to do. It's almost a cliche. You know, I remember when I was a kid, it was in all the magazines. Oh, humans only use about 10% of their brains. And everybody was so willing to accept that. But if you start saying, gee, maybe we could talk to each other telepathically. Or maybe we can move things with our mind power. Or maybe we can predict the future with our mind power. Well, that's crazy. So wait a minute, what do you think we're doing with that other 90% of our brains? Everyone's so willing to accept the fact that we're only using a little piece of what we can do. But you start speculating that maybe we can do this, maybe we can do that, and no one wants to look at it, because that's nuts. Uh, one other really funny story, and I, I never thought of this in connection, and I'm not making any claims, I'm just, this is an odd thing, and maybe other people here have had this happen too. Um, one or two summers ago, middle of July, I was in my car, I was alone in my car, I dropped my kids off at a, an amusement park, and I had to go home and get something, and I was trying to get back to them. It was five o'clock, rush hour, incredibly hot day, I was stuck at this interchange where two major highways cross each other. In Rochester, it's called the Can of Worms, for anybody who knows the area. There's a reason they call it that. We were sitting there. It was bumper to bumper, no shoulder, because they were probably doing construction like they always are in Rochester. So I'm sitting there totally stuck, and I, I glanced down at my dashboard, and my temperature light is going. <laughs> I can't do anything. I can't get out of the car. I can't take it any place. There is literally nothing I can do about this. And I don't know what possessed me. I pointed my finger at the dashboard and I said, don't you dare. And the needle was doing this and it went, <laughs> swear, it went back down. It went back to normal. I picked up the kids, I got it home, I checked it, it had no coolant in it, there was a leak. I got it all fixed, everything was fine. I have no idea why the needle went back when I told it to. But I'd be curious to know how many other people can do that if they find themselves in that kind of feeling of desperation that I was in. Now to my mind, this right here is the key to doing all of this research into the alien abduction phenomenon. Because this is what we're trying to get people to work not only through the, own, the stresses in their own lives from their personal experiences, but then to share this with the rest of the world so that we can all realize that we can do more than we thought we could.